Worcester. Okay, and the Greens have started now. We'll cross now to Bob Brown. Is has been up Carbon Day, but uh, it's uh, effectively a great Green Action Day for this nation. I want to begin by congratulating this Prime Minister uh, and Ministers Combe and Swan and their teams for being uh, the presiding officer of the Cabinet Subcommittee, which has led to uh, this uh, remarkably good outcome for Australia. I also want to thank my colleague Christine Milne, who has been a driving force not just for the establishment of this committee, without her there would not be a committee, but also for many of the uh, great ideas which are part of the outcome today uh, and which have uh, been a result of her great knowledge of what's uh, happening in this country, but uh, perhaps more particularly in the international scene, ideas that Australia has been able to take up and, and develop in tackling dangerous climate change. Also, my colleague, uh, the member for Mel Melbourne, Adam Bant, who's been enormously uh, fruitful and uh, helpful in uh, our way through to this outcome. And I must pay tribute to Tony Windsor and Rob Oakeshott. They've been uh, very, very fine contributors and they've shown a great deal of statespersonship in uh, this outcome and their electorates uh, and the bush is going to get a real dividend today because they uh, had the gumption to take this on and to see it through and to make sure there is a rural and regional dividend which is uh, so obvious in this outcome. We are on a planet facing catastrophic climate change. Uh, the impact will be 5 to 20 per cent of the wealth of our grandchildren if we don't act on it. As Maggie Thatcher said uh, 20 years ago, and I heard it in the government's press conference just now, I think from the Treasurer, every uh, delay here uh, makes things more expensive on real action. Uh, but uh, we are here in the process of saving the Great Barrier Reef, Kakadu, Ningaloo, the highlands right across this, the snow country right across the southeast of Australia, our biodiversity, the wonderful wildlife of uh, this nation, both on land and in our, in our oceans, and giving that across safely and securely to the children and grandchildren of this nation and, and of the whole planet. And this today is a world leading outcome. It is going to lead to better outcomes. Uh, at Durban and the next international conference on climate change. And if you look at equivalent countries, um, Russia, Canada, China, New Zealand, the United States, uh, Australia is now, has broken out of uh, the do little or don't uh, break through into joining the leading countries in the world to become a world leader. We can be very, very proud as Australians of this outcome uh, today. I uh, just name a couple of the uh, particular breakthroughs. You'll note that the target for greenhouse gas pollution reduction by 2050 has gone to 80% reduction for the country, from 60% as uh, was previously uh, mooted. There is a biodiversity fund of nearly $1 billion dollars uh, this is going to help in rural and regional Australia for such things as protecting our woodlands, but uh, in particular protecting uh, our native species, just like the koala, which is rapidly headed towards extinction under the impact of climate change and loss of habitat. There will be, uh, on Treasury advice, no new coal-fired power stations in this country and very likely the closure of some of the dirtiest and most polluting uh, power stations in the country, uh, coal, coal burning power stations. And uh, Christine will uh, give more detail on this in a moment, but a $10 billion fund for renewable energy, that wasn't there uh, with the CPRS. And it is going to help this country's trajectory from being a fossil fuel burning country through to a renewable country taking its place at the lead of the world with job creation, economic wellbeing, export income. Uh, and a much safer lifestyle as we move to mid-century. I'm uh, very, very pleased, very proud 
uh, as leader of the Greens, uh, to have this outcome. We know um, we, it's, just a, it's just a fact of life that uh, we're getting this outcome um, because we were here and because we had a Prime Minister and a Labor government which had uh, the national responsibility to take this on along with the independents who are involved. It's a great day for Australia. It's a historic day for Australia. And I don't think there's ever been a, an outcome uh, environmentally driven uh, to protect the well-being of Australians now and into the future that can match this one in Australian governance history. Christine. Thank you, Bob. Well, this is an historic moment in Australia. This is the moment where Australia turns its back on the fossil fuel age and turns its face towards the greatest challenge of the 21st century, and that is addressing global warming. And not only are we turning our face to that challenge, but we're stepping up. We have in this package managed to change the way Australia thinks about the science. This is a critical component of the package. By moving to an 80% reduction target by 2050, by going to a carbon budgeting approach, and with a climate authority, an independent climate authority, which will look at new developments in the science, what's happening with international obligations, and be able to translate those into the caps that are being set and recommended by that authority to the parliament, we were sending a signal to the world that Australia is now prepared to look at what is its fair share in terms of the burden that developed countries have to take on in order to guarantee our children the chance of a safe climate. This is the big outcome today. That's why it's so historic. We have a whole generation of Australians who will be looking at this and saying, Thank you, you have given us the opportunity to now work for a safe climate. In terms of specifics of the scheme, there are several improvements there that uh, the Greens have secured. In the actual um, emissions trading part of this package, people will notice there is now a floor price. There wasn't one there before. So this package will start, the scheme will start with a $23 price going to meet an international price projected to be about $25.40 in, in 2015, but there will be a floor price starting at uh, $15 at the time we move to flexible trading. This is anticipation and recognising that we want to make sure that there is certainty for investors in the renewable energy sector. The $10 billion into renewable energy is very exciting. It recognises that the price isn't high enough to drive the revolution in renewables that we need, and therefore we're going with a major set of complementary measures for renewable energy. We have ARENA, the new Australian Renewable Energy Agency, which will deal with the early research and development commercialisation, moving through the, spe the whole spectrum till we get to the other end, the, the finance corporation, being able not only to provide loans but also to leverage private sector capital. So that's a fantastic improvement. On energy efficiency, again, this package allows us to transform our sectors, our heavy industrial sectors, by providing incentives for them to move to more energy efficient uh, forms of production. Then in the land sector, and this is also incredibly exciting, to have a biodiversity fund which says we know in the face of climate change we need to build resilience in our ecosystems. And so we have the biodiversity fund to do that. And of course with the carbon farming initiative there is much greater sophistication than previously so that people will be rewarded for avoided deforestation and degradation on one hand, and on the other hand, we have uh, also uh, made, it, uh, made a change so that biomass from native forests will no longer be able to earn certificates under the Renewable Energy Target Scheme. So it's a big win for Australia's biodiversity, a big promotion for renewable energy and all the businesses and jobs that come from that, and a, a much better emissions trading scheme with real ambition on the climate. Yeah. Thanks. I'd just like to pay tribute to the extraordinary uh, historic task that the people of Melbourne have uh, achieved today. Um, 
we went to the last election calling for urgent action on climate change and it was the number one issue in my electorate. And uh, after Melbourne made history by electing a Green for the first time, we were then in a position to sit down and negotiate with uh, the Gillard government about the continuation of that government. And the one thing, the number one thing that we asked for was uh, urgent action on climate change. And I'm really pleased that less than a year into uh, our term, the term of this government, we have helped deliver um, a kickstart for Australia's clean energy future. We went to the last election with a proposal for a uh, circuit breaker of $23 a tonne for the carbon price, uh, moving up to an emissions trading scheme. And we've not only delivered that, but so much more. We've got $10 billion for uh, renewable and clean energy. We've got a new $3 billion clean energy fund. And we're now going to see dirty power stations like Hazelwood start to close. Uh, and we will not see any more uh, commercial coal-fired power stations built in this country. And it's an extraordinary uh, effort. And I want to acknowledge the, um, the great step that the people of Melbourne took and the national and world uh, impact they had by going green at the last election. Acknowledge the, um, the great step that the people of Melbourne took and the national and world uh, impact they had by going green at the last election. And just before I open this up to questions, uh, I must say, and, and it, every state has got a big dividend coming out of this, but not least Tasmania. The uh, Tasmania tends to have one of the lowest income settings in the country and therefore will benefit um, disproportionately from the generous household compensation that's involved in this program. Uh, the alternative program from the Coalition, of course, has no household compensation at all. And, uh, and the uh, impact of, for, of the Biodiversity Fund and the changes in the setting regarding renewable energy accreditation of uh, forest furnaces is going to be... Uh, these are amongst the the uh, wins for Tasmania and we're very happy as uh, two Greens coming from the island state that um, this is generating such a dividend for our home state as well as the bigger island of the mainland. Well, uh, questions? There's more. There are measures um, in the government's package um, that it appears that you don't agree with, including um, additional support, job support for the coal um, and the steel industries, as well as two years for heavy transport not to have to pay fuel costs. Do you intend to support those measures when it comes before the Senate? We haven't got the detail on those or the um, costings uh, or the legislation. So we'll be looking at that. The Prime Minister's uh, just indicated that, uh, of course, they'll be seeking to get the coalition to support uh, the, the programs as well that's involved there. But they, these are ones where the detail is not available and we'll, we'll look at it when the time comes. So you might I, not support it in the Senate, those Well, measures. we might support it. It uh, remains to be seen what's in those packages. Senator Brown, related to those industry assistance measures, doesn't that show that some of the industry assistance in this package is now more generous than the CPRS you rejected two years ago? Doesn't that show that you were wrong to reject the CPRS back then? Oh, well, I'll ask Christine to answer that. Uh, what this package shows is how right we were, how uh, important it was. Uh, and I might just uh, get the setting here. That was a failed negotiation with the Coalition uh, and no negotiation with the Greens who had measures, including some of those that are written into this, to offer to the Rudd government back then. But there was no negotiation. It was a rejection. And uh, the, uh, the, the, um, all the work that's gone in between now and then has made this so worthwhile. And the feedback we're already getting from right around the country is extremely positive. So we're very heartened by that, but I'll ask Christine to go into the particulars. And just to make the point, of course, that the former proposal was just for an emissions trading scheme. This has a major component for renewable energy, energy efficiency and the land sector, and it's so different. It's like uh, comparing um, chalk and cheese, really, because with the changed architecture, particularly on the 80% reduction by 2050 and the budgeting approach, we have a vastly different way of addressing the climate challenge. But to go to your specifics on energy assistance, uh, on uh, industry assistance, 
In the energy-intensive trade-exposed sector, under the CPRS, they had 10 years guaranteed assistance at the level, at the initial level they started. They had five years plus five years warning period. This time they have five years of guaranteed assistance, but during that time the Productivity Commission will review that assistance and review going to a principled approach. If the principled approach is practicable, it will be implemented and so the level of assistance will change. But even having said that, there are several caveats saying that the government can ask the Productivity Commission to review earlier than 2014-15 the sectors that are receiving the most assistance, the sectors which are growing the most and any sector which appears to have a windfall gain. And we've reduced the warning period to three years and it can overlap the five years. So in fact, instead of having 10 years guaranteed assistance at the initial level, uh, the energy intensive trade exposed have five years and then possible changes. In terms of the coal generators, last time they had 10 years of uh, assistance and um, it was uh, considerably more in terms of, uh, I think it's a, a $1.8 billion less, and it's over five years that that assistance takes place. The other, the other I mean, if you want to look for a single difference between uh, the CPRS and this, $10 billion for renewable energy, and that is industry assistance from start to finish and job creating from start to finish. And 2,000 megawatts bought out of uh, the dirtiest coal in Australia straight away. So we will see one of the biggest changes in, energy, in assistance is that we are pulling forward emissions reductions. We're pulling them forward in every sector. We're closing down the dirtiest coal-fired power stations. We're bringing forward emissions reductions in the land sector. We're bringing forward renewable energy. This is a package which brings forward emission reductions, not pushes it out for a, a decade. Senator, Senator, on that Senator, point... Um, in, in relation to your answer to Lyon's question, um, if this $4 billion that is now a cost to the budget, if that's approved through the Parliament, isn't that asking the budget to fund carbon abatement or, or compo for uh, carbon abatement? Isn't that similar to what Tony Abbott in principle is proposing? And why uh, would you let that happen instead of agreeing that the carbon well, revenue use that instead? You know, the um, budgetary ramifications the Treasurer has just spoken about and uh, he's making it very clear that much of that's up front. But uh, we, uh, that's been a matter for the government to determine. We've worked in with that. We've listened to all the economic arguments and uh, we're taking this as a package. Uh, I mean, there will be components. People will say, why did you agree to that? Well, because um, agreement for all parties has meant give and take. Mm. And, um, you know, this, is, this has had its moments, this package. There's been times when it did look like maybe we're not going to make it. But uh, all parties have been prepared to go that extra bit, and, and that includes the, the Greens. So, what was yeah. the rationale for not agreeing to those specific measures that, that are now considered government measures? Um, well, they haven't been worked out in detail enough, and we, we weren't uh, prepared in the timeline that was available to just tick off on, on uh, quite expensive. You know, we're looking at hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars there. And um, there's other industry sectors in Australia that very much want uh, assistance, not least the manufacturing sector, which, uh, which has got a, the biggest job component. It's up there towards a million jobs. The mining industry in Australia has got 200,000 jobs and uh, is extraordinarily wealthy. And um, we're, we're very well aware that we've got to look after um, a whole range of Australians and we're very keen to do that. So, but, you know, the government's going to come up with proposals We'll look at them, and they'll be, they'll be putting them to the other parties as well. Senator, you uh, mentioned before that uh, you want to close down the dirtiest coal-fired power stations. Are you, are you hoping that Hazelwood will be one of them? Well, I'll let uh, Adam talk on that, but it's, uh, Hazelwood is one of the filthiest polluters of the atmosphere on the planet, not just in Australia. And it has, it has been the, the receiver of quite a lot of government uh, or public assistance. And uh, it, it will be, um, or, you know, there's 2,000 megawatts there uh, to, of the worst pollution in Australia that we're looking at uh, stopping. 
And uh, that's, that's, of course, heartland territory if you're going to be able to transform to a, a clean economy. Hazelwood would have been closed by now if the former Victorian government hadn't given it an unwarranted extension um, to allow it to keep putting pollution into the atmosphere. And the uh, proposal is to close down up to 2,000 megawatts. Um, of course, Hazelwood's about 1,600 megawatts. And um, if Hazelwood wants to stick its hand up to be um, one of the power stations that closes either in part or in full, uh, in a staged way, with um, due regard for the workers to make sure that they're looked after, and with due regard for energy security, um, then I think that will be a great outcome for Victoria. Senator, so is it true to say that you can't be sure this scheme will reduce emissions by any more than the 5% that CPA is going to be reduced by that 2020? Uh, well, I'm sure it will. Yeah. Why are you sure it will? Because um, it sets in place a authority uh, which is not, and this comes uh, from uh, Senator Milne, it is not dissimilar to that which is functioning at arm's length to government in the United Kingdom and which has recently led to the Cameron government halving uh, or going to 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by the mid-2020s. And it will give advice to government and to the parliament uh, and we will, I, I think, common sense will prevail on that. But, uh, you know, we can't bind future parliaments. We'll, we'll wait and see. And we will uh, be looking forward to this process working here as well as it has worked in the United Kingdom. Can I just add to that? Just a moment, Christine. If I could just add to that. Once you change a mindset, then you allow all kinds of possibilities which people don't seem to appreciate it there at the moment. There's huge opportunity to reduce emissions through technological innovation in all sorts of sectors, through energy efficiency, particularly through renewable energy, and particularly in rural and regional Australia through the land sector. Once the community embraces the idea that this country has, has turned its back on the fossil fuel age and is going towards a future of reducing emissions, we will see, I believe, much greater abatement than anybody has actually recognised at this time. The experience we've had with renewable energy in Australia is every scheme that's ever been out there has been oversubscribed and has surprised everybody at how much people want to get engaged. The uncertainty in Australia is now over. We are moving to a new future. And I think you're going to find, particularly that generation that are now in universities, will embrace this in exactly the same way as they embraced the space race, the whole thing, and get out there, and we will find in a decade that we have done far more than we ever imagined we could. Is there an agreement with the MP MPCCC? And one of the things that the Climate Authority is going to have to do is set out a map for us getting there. And um, uh, Professor Roscano was asked at the press club whether um, if such an independent authority faced with ambitious targets um, would recommend a target above 5% by 2020, he said, I can't see how they wouldn't. And that's been the experience in the UK. When you set ambitious long-term caps as we've secured through this deal, we're going to need more ambition than 5%. And that's why uh, in the documents that you've got, you will see that the minimum is referred to as something that's at least 5%. And uh, uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised um, if an independent authority looking at that does what Professor Garno has said and does what the UK has said. And uh, something else to point out too is that uh, under this package, the uh, Australian energy market operator is now um, required to start planning scenarios for getting Australia towards 100% renewable energy. So I'm, now, uh, I'm aware that our um, independent friends are here, so I'll, I'll take three more quick questions and then we'll make way for them. And we'll be available, of course, for further questions during the day. Relating to the Climate Authority and setting those targets, um, what is the rationale then for the government having the final say on the pollution caps? It's exactly the same way as the United Kingdom Climate Committee works. It makes recommendations to the government. The government has uh, a few months to respond to those targets and then 
uh, if it, it has to make a recommendation to the Parliament in terms of a regulation to give effect to those targets, if the government determines to set a different target than that recommended by the committee, it will have to set out its reasons, and this will be provided as a special budget paper in Australia, and so you would, have to, you would expect that a parliament would have to have very good reasons for rejecting the advice of an independent climate authority. The, that is the rationale for it. There's enormous respect for the Climate Committee in the UK, which is why the Cameron government has just accepted very, very strong targets from that committee, um, in fact, considering a quite a lot of unrest in its own uh, cabinet. So we would expect that the status of the Climate Authority is going to be such that no government would really say that it ought not to take on those targets. I'd just like to put a word here too for Professor Ross Garner, um, uh, a remarkable Australian who's contributed uh, to this debate for a long, long time and, and as, as you all know, has been a, um, a prodigious uh, innovator and producer of well-based information to help, uh, along with other experts, uh, to inform this committee. Senator Brown, how, does, how did you pick $23? How do you think it stacks up against uh, prices in the rest of the world? And uh, I think there's also a, a ceiling. Uh, do you, are you happy with the, the $20 ceiling? I'm sorry, I don't know about that one, but uh, I'll just answer at the outset that the $23 uh, was what we went to the last election last year with, and uh, that's uh, now the the price. Uh, and uh, we're very uh, happy that uh, that has that has been the price. You'll know the Business Council of Australia recommended ten dollars. We know that if you're going to transform to uh, out of coal to renewables without this big package that's here, that makes the difference. You'd need a higher price. So it's the committee that's adopted this price and um, there's been, again, quite a lot of debate about that and uh, we're happy with the outcome. Okay. How does it stack up against the rest of the world? It so. stacks up very well at the moment. The uh, international price is about $18 and uh, the key component in thinking about what the price should be is the point at which it connects with the international price. We're automatically going to emissions trading in 2015 in a flexible price uh, period we want to make sure that Australia doesn't experience any price shocks at that time. There has to be investor certainty. We're providing that investor certainty by saying the projection at the moment is that the international price in 2015 will be somewhere around $25.40. We're starting with 23 to hit that in 2015, the $25 price in 2015. And we have a price uh, floor to give certainty to investors that regardless if there is a drop, uh, we are going to have six years of certainty. There will be three years going from 23 to 25, and then there will be a floor price underpinning another three years out from there. So that provides that certainty. As to the cap to which you refer, it's $20 above the international price. It has been our advice that it is very unlikely that the price will ever hit the cap. Can I just ask on um, budget uh, neutrality? It was agreed by the MPCCC that the scheme would be revenue neutral. Now, I'm not much of a budget expert, <laughs> but I can see that the bulk of the uh, clean energy fund has been pushed beyond the forward estimates. Mm -hmm. There's tax cuts uh, worth about $15 billion. There's an increase in industry assistance. Can you understand why some people would look at this and say, I can't see how this can't be a drag on the budget? Well, uh, let me say, we were... Um, uh, the, the Greens have been content on budget neutrality. You'll know that we have been pushing for other taxing mechanisms, such as the super profits tax, uh, which would uh, ensure uh, different budgetary outcomes. But the uh, government has uh, had a large say in the uh, overall settings of this uh, package. It's Treasury that's done the uh, extraordinary work on it and good on them. And um, that's how it is. Do you think it needs to be budget neutral over the longer term, or is it better that it's we'll not budget neutral? Well, we'll find um, that not only in the long term, I think, will it be um, budget neutral, but there's a big dividend here for all Australians. It's going to avoid a much bigger drag on the budget through climate change. And can I just give you those figures for global food prices, up by 20% due to climate change in the last uh, couple of years, 
and yet uh, there's going to be less than one percentage point difference uh, in those prices because of this package. Climate change is already causing cost of living rises ahead of those that will, be, uh, uh, will flow on from this package. Now, I'd, I'd like to... Um, uh, yes, uh, Christine's wanting to pay, so a word there, and then uh, we'll have uh, Mr Windsor and Mr Oakshot take the podium. Yes, and just as a conclusion, I would certainly like to pay tribute to the Multi-Party Climate Change Committee and the, uh, all of the public servants and our own advisers who've worked so hard to achieve what is an historic result for Australia. After the election, we uh, sought and secured the agreement of the Prime Minister to set up a multi-party climate committee with expert advisers to work through a process of delivering a carbon price mechanism in this term of government. And I just want to emphasise how important that process has been and how the advisers... Um, we had Will Steffen, who provided wonderful scientific input to the process, Ross Garno, who gave us all the work with his update. We had Patricia Faulkner, who focused very much on making sure there was an equitable outcome for the most vulnerable Australians, and Rod Sims, who was in there talking about the real uh, economic impacts, and it was very important to be informed by those experts. But what was wonderful about the process is that you have people across all the parties and the coalition could have participated and chose not to, but people representing all the different interests in the parliament around the table. And that is why we've achieved the outcome we have today. That is a real testament to what happens when you have a collaborative process, people of goodwill, all wanting to make sure that we deliver for our children the opportunity of a safe climate. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Kristen.